today we shall discuss their language and literature under Mughal India. India, as we all know, is a multilingual country with many different languages and dialectics. It is not possible at this stage to speak on all the languages and dialectics. What we'll do is we'll make a selection on the basis of the literature prevalent at that particular time. India, under the Mughals, had three particular languages which were more or less spread all over the Mughal Empire. Arabic, Persian, and Sanskrit. In these, Arabic was much less known. This was mainly used for inscriptions, sometimes in the coins as well. Persian was the most uh, used language, and Sanskrit was there in pre-Mughal, or rather pre-Sultanate India, but with the coming of the Turks and the Afghans, the Sanskrit language declined quite considerably. In the pre-Sultanate period, that is pre-13th century, there are certain areas which were quite famous for Sanskrit, which we would see first today. Bihar, Kashmir was most important, Gujarat as well, and to a certain extent other places like Varanasi, etc. It is stated generally that the Turks and Afghans had destroyed the Sanskrit language and destroyed the Hindu culture at the same time. This was a British view which had continued for some time and some of the Indian historians like Haraprasad Shastri had accepted this. But if we look at the output of the Sanskrit during the Mughal period, we would see not only the Mughals had been patrons of Sanskrit literature, some of them wrote in Sanskrit as well, but uh, they did not try to destroy the Sanskrit language as such, or the Sanskrit literature as such. As a matter of fact, there were other very valid reasons for the decline of Sanskrit to which we would come later. When we come to the Mughal period, in the early Mughal days in the 16th century, we see that South India was still quite well known for Sanskrit patronage. And Sanskrit literature flourished, still flourished, in some of the Hindu courts. But under the Mughals, we see also that Sanskrit output was going on. There was uh, what is known as Slesh Kabbo, the uh, poems with double or even triple meanings. But this was mostly prevalent in South India. In Northern India, the one, that, uh, one type that was quite famous was historical literature. For example, in Western India, Kovindra Paramacharya wrote the biography of Shivaji. He was a contemporary of Shivaji. His uh, son, Govinda Dotto, and his grandson also, Dev Dotto, they also wrote on the sons of Shivaji, Shambhuji, and others. So there was a tradition of historical literature uh, continuing in the Mughal period may not be under their direct patronage, but certainly under their influence. There were others like Praggo Bhatto and others who wrote on other uh, kings, etc. Now, apart from the historical literature, there were other kinds of Sanskrit uh, literature. For example, Jayaram Pandey wrote on the poets assembled at the court of 
Shaho Ji, Shivaji's father. And there were others also who wrote on different poets, wrote on different type of literature. But gradually, the trend was, the principal trend was to write either on the bhaktis or on the Puranas. The Puranic episodes uh, became quite popular. Now, in these Puranic episodes and in these uh, other things, we see that the historical literature still flourished in a different sense. For example, in the pre-Sultanate India, in Kashmir, there was the Kalhans Raj Tarangani. And the tradition continued in the Mughal period. There were at least two scholars who wrote on the basis of Raj Tarangani, the type of Raj Tarangani, the type of historical literature. There was one who wrote on the conquest of Kashmir by Akbar. So on the whole, we see that the historical literature continued in some form or the other, despite the fact that the bhakti and the Puranic episodes created a star among the scholars and the poets. Apart from this, there was another type of Sanskrit literature called eulogistic poems. For example, the court poet of Bikanir, king of Bikanir, Karan Singh, and his son Anup Singh, these court poets wrote their biographies. But there were others who were not in the courts as such, but they still write. For example, Pandit Jagannath wrote on Ashraf Khan, who was the patron, and he named it at Asaf Bilas. There was another one who wrote, Pandit Jagadaban, who wrote on Darashuko. Darashuko himself wrote a Sanskrit uh, poem, eulogistic poem, praising Nrishingo Acharya of Varanasi. So there were this kind of interaction between the different communities. So far as Sanskrit literature is concerned, particularly during this Mughal period. There were also other type of literature, fictional literature, literature with uh, play, with drama. For example, the drama was quite popular. In Bengal also, we find in Navadip, Kobi Karnapur wrote a drama on the biography of Chaitanya. So therefore, the, there were one-act plays also, which were patronized by the king. Now, these kind of Sanskrit writings, different types of writings, in one sense, it uh, freed the literature from the clutches of both Bhakti and the Puranas, but it was not totally secular as such. One cannot call it really the secular one. So therefore, what we see that despite the popular saying that the Sanskrit has declined, it has certainly become very artificial, there is no doubt about it, but the variety of the Sanskrit literature had remained th throughout the Mughal Empire and as well as in different parts of Mughal Empire. After Sanskrit, we might start Hindi, which was fairly popular among the people uh, in northern India. The best one, the best writer was Goswami Tulsi Das, whom we all know, who wrote in 1574, Ramcharit Manas. Ramcharit Manas, one of the most popular uh, writings on Ram by anyone, by any scholar of India. Now, Ramcharit Manas has certain uh, Brajabhasha. It was not exactly modern Hindi. The certain Brajabhasha included. 
but in later times some of the words had been altered. But still, it remained Hindi. It was a bro the early Hindi with Braja Bhasa and sometimes with Khari Boli, what is known as the old Delhi Hindi. So it was in a way different from the modern uh, Hindi as such. Tulsidas was a very orthodox Brahmin, followed uh, the devotion of Ram, as we all know, wrote uh, the, this beautiful piece. He was followed by many other equally important people. Uh, one was Mirabai, who died around 1548, and she was a princess of Mewar, who married another Rajput prince, became widow, then surrendered herself to Krishna and uh, sang devotional songs in love of Krishna. Her melodious voice and her devotion made her a celebrity of her own time. This was in original Marwadi language, which was different from the Hindi, but it has been now it has been altered to Hindi as such. There was one more called Surdas, who was also very famous, and who wrote on the poems of Krishna, Krishna Leela, etc. Now, best known uh, poem of Hindi is Padmavat written by Malik Muhammad Jaisi during the reign of Akbar on the affair of Alauddin Khalji and Padmini of Chitor. Now this is an allegorical uh, writing. Allegorical in the sense this is not exactly history. Malik Muhammad Jaisi who wrote in Brajo Bhasha, not in Persian, he was writing nearly 150 years after the event. And now it has been proved, actually it has been proved in 1934 by uh, Professor Oja of Bihar, that the entire episode is imaginary. There was no one called Padmeni. And therefore, uh, the contemporary poet Amir Khosru, who accompanied Alauddin Khalji never mentioned it. There was no contemporary mention of Padmini as such. But whatever the merit of the historicity, the fact remains that it was written in a beautiful style. And Malik Muhammad Jaisi was certainly one of the most important medieval uh, poets of his days. This was translated in Bengali in the late 17th century in the court of Arakan. And it has been published both in Bengali as well as in Brajo Bhasha. Punjabi, if we come next to Hindi, we see that Adi Grantha was uh, compiled under the order of the fifth Guru, Guru Arjun, in 1604. It was written in pure Punjabi, the earliest Punjabi. And the advantage is that because of the order of the Guru, the words could not be changed at all. So therefore, the 1604 edition had remained exactly as it is. There was no change in this. Now, Adi Granth, we all know, is the book of the gurus of the devotion, of the attributes of the creator. It was a religious uh, book, which was revered by all the six uh, of Punjab and else, elsewhere. Apart from Adi Granth, 
there was another one called Janam Sakha, which was the sayings of Guru Nanak. There was only one copy existing in the British Museum. This was published in 1885. And this is also remained in this kind of form. Although gradually one could see that from the Adi Granth onwards, there was a mixture of Arabic and Persian words for some time. Sometimes the terms of Hindu yogic practices were also included. But the Punjabi literature has one uh, extremely important step, that it has some secular literature along with it. A poet called Damodar Gulati wrote the story of Hira and Ranja, the tragedy. And he claimed that he was uh, a witness to most of the events, which is doubtful, wrote during the time of Akbar. But this was followed by another one who wrote this on the same theme, Waris Shah, who also wrote the tragedy of Hira and Ranja. So there was a secular literature growing in the Punjabi literature, then now fully developed into Punjabi. And one could see some of the Sufi poets were writing uh, on different parts of religion. Apart from Punjabi, Gujarat was once famous for literature. Bahalim translated Ramayana in Gujarati, and there were certain others who also wrote on either on the Bhakti or on the Puranic episodes. These are the two most important themes that uh, the Gujarati poets had used. But sometimes they had used many Hindi words. As a matter of fact, Hindi was never totally forgotten. Sometimes the Persian words are also included. Among the uh, important uh, writers were Miraben and uh, Mehta, who wrote Narottam Mehta, who wrote on uh, Gujarati, but with uh, Hindi words mixing in it, mainly on the devotion, mainly on the Krishna Leela, a devotee of Krishna. This was the personal story of Krishna's life in the Brandaban, the pastoral life, one could say, on the bank of the Jamuna, his plays with the maids and etc. But other types were there coming up, not, not very secular, but in uh, more or less in uh, literature, in literary form, there was always a conflict, not a violent one, of course, between the Hindu Puranic episodes and the Bhakti cult. Uh, neither of these two was totally subsumed by the others. And both continued to form part of the Gujarati literature. There is a difference between uh, Sanskrit, Hindi, and Gujarati literature in the Mughal days. In the Sanskrit literature, we find very strong influence of historical literature. As I have mentioned, Komindra Paramacharya wrote on Shahaji. There were certain others who wrote on his son, his grandson, etc. Wrote on the sons of Shivaji as well. There was also one on Raja, Raja Ram. 
In Hindi, what is interesting is that in the court of Akbar, many courtiers used to write in Hindi. For example, Abdul Rahim Khani Khanan, son of Bairam Khan, he wrote Hindi poems apart from the Persian poet. He was a very good poet and he wrote at least 17 Hindi poems, many of which had been translated. Birbal used to write in Hindi, naturally it is understood. Tansen used to write in Hindi as well. But in the Gujarati, we do not find any such uh, writings. Even we do not find the court poets or historical literature. In Hindi, the influence of the historical literature of, this, of Sanskrit is there. For example, Bihari Lal wrote on Raja Jai Singh in Hindi. Lal Kobi wrote on Chhatrasal Bundela, which was very accurate and has been used by the historians many times. But in Gujarati, we do not have this kind of thing. We Gujarati have a, an exceptional kind. For example, we have one po poet called Akho, A-K-H-O, Akho. He was working in the Royal Mint at Gujarat. He was accused of embezzlement of gold. He was imprisoned. When he left the prison, he went to Varanasi, studied Vedanta for almost 10 years, and then wrote in the language of the people the entire Vedanta philosophy. Now, this kind of attempt was rather rare in the literature under the Mughals. Generally, there had been writings on Vedanta or writings on Ramayana, but these are for the erudite scholars, with, often with notations. But in case of Akho, this was simply not there. So therefore, the, although the language and the literature of the different periods, of the different regions were coming up, but the development was not a linear one in that sense. That is a straight path. It went through different experiments influenced by some others, influenced to some extent by the, to a great extent, by the bhakti cult and the Puranas, etc. In, this could be seen in Navadip, in the rise of the Nobunai literature, new logic literature, which actually has started from the early 16th century before the coming of the Mughals, and actually before that even. But it continued during the 16th century, and it f became very artificial in the sense that it became a, a mere juggling of words instead of the inner meaning and the content uh, which was there in a, in a much great depth in earlier period. But in Navadip, one could see that Sanskrit was still being taught. In Varanasi, this was also the same. It's being st still being taught. But in Varanasi, this Nobunai, this logic of the grammar, the logic of the logic, this was not there that much. One or two scholars were there, but not more. In Navadip, they flourished. And they flourished because of various reasons with which we are not concerned today. So therefore, first of all, it is very difficult to say that there was a decline in Sanskrit. One could say 
there was certainly some kind of decline in output, but there was an increase in the variety. There was an attempt also to bring out secular literature, which was in some form was there in pre-Sultanate period, but not so many. But here in uh, the region and languages, it is coming out very clearly. And then also we see that the developments, as I have said, the developments of the regional literature created some problems for Sanskrit because people began to be attracted towards much more towards regional lit literature, which were being performed many times, read openly in the, on the banks of the Ganges or other rivers, and people used to listen and they could understand. In case of Sanskrit, this was a major problem. So therefore, there was a spurt in the growth of the regional literature, not necessarily because the Mughals had patronized it, but because of the circumstances of the times, because of the aspiration of the people to understand certain things, to understand their literature as such, to understand the devotional uh, aspects, they understand the attributes of God and so on and so forth. But at the same time, one would note that this was more or less at the end of the Sultanate period, there was an increasing tendency in different regions to become independent. It was this independence, this urge for independence, that had given spark perhaps to the rise of regional literature. For example, in Bengal, one could see only Bengali literature from the end of the 15th century, while by 1350, the Bengal sultans had become independent of Delhi. Yet, we do not have any other Bengali document before 13, before 1485 and so on. So, therefore, looking back as such, one would not agree with the view that the Turco-Afghans had destroyed Sanskrit culture. But there were different reasons for their decline. And there were also the reasons for the rise of the different languages. We'd continue this the next day.